Are you going to turn on your camera, Simon? Uh, I can. I can turn on the camera. Uh, let's take a look here. It would help me because um, I lip read, so it helps me be able to understand you. Of course. Okay. Well, let's thank you. I don't know how presentable I am, but here we go. Um, so the question is uh, today: Are we going to cover career or career and money, and um, and what's the difference? Um, you have to understand in the in the Vedic view and the astrology view, the it's the goal of an astrologer to put themselves out of business. What this means is the goal of any astrologer is to help their client know themselves so thoroughly, so completely, that they don't need the astrologer anymore. Meaning that you help people find their purpose, their drive, their dharma. The, the word, the core word is dharma. And when you help people find their dharma, everything flows from there. When you're living in this when you're going with the stream of your life, prosperity comes to you, love comes to you, spirituality comes to you naturally. When you're not living or you're trying to swim upstream, that's when problems happen. So the goal of astrology is to help you find your dharma. And there is no one method alone that does this. Now, I teach a whole year-long course on, called Dharma Type Certification which is about exactly that, helping people find their dharma on the physical level so they know what, what the best diet is for you, the best exercise, and so on. Help you find your dharma on the spiritual level, to know what your personal deity is, what your core mantra is, um, and, and, and how to approach the divine. Then there's the social level, to know what your best job is, your best career is. So dharma isn't just one thing. It's a multi-layered, uh, facet of existence, but when you align with it, you know it. You know you're doing it. It's like, um, you know, they, they say this about other things like sex. Like, how do you know if you've had an orgasm? Well, if you, if you don't know, then you don't know. Something like that. Anyway, the point is that when, you, when you're living your dharma, you're, you're in the flow. Um, so the goal of what we're going to do today is to offer one method. There are many ways of assessing dharma, and to, to really get into that, it, uh, it will take multiple classes. So, uh, but this is a first step, and this is a very easy and I think user-friendly first step. Um, so let's go ahead and get right down to it, and I will, um, let's do a, you share here, and we'll start with this presentation. Alrighty. Well, I should say, are there any other questions before we move on? And I hope I hope that answered your question at least in part. So yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the. It, this actually, this presentation is from part of our Dharma type certification class. Uh, I'm sort of reusing the same template here. Um, and before we even consider the career method, we have to reconsider because we're going to be using the planets to show us career. But you have to know if a planet is strong or weak to know if the person, let's say the person has a government combination. And you'll see what that is in a minute. Meaning they work in the government. Well, if their planets are weak, it makes a government combination. They may be a clerk somewhere, you know, in some government office. But if the planets are strong, they may very well be the president of the United States or somewhere up there in the higher echelons. So strength of the planets has a lot to say about the level that you're going to operate in. So it's worth reviewing what makes planets strong, okay? So one of, one of the ways the planets become strong is by being exalted. And we talked about this last week with the placement of the planets and their exaltation sign. So for any chart, when the sun is in Aries, it's very strong. When the moon's in Taurus, it's very strong, and so on. Jupiter in the queen's chamber, Mercury in the civilized city. Remember that presentation last week? 
So this is something to memorize and to just drill until you know it, okay? And of course, once you know the exaltation, you also know the opposite, debilitation. Um, so you only have to know one to know that the opposite of Aries is Libra. That's the sign directly uh, seven signs away. And so the sun is debilitated in Libra. So one source of strength is exaltation. Another source is when the planet sits in its own sign. And so here, these are the signs of the planet's own. And I know this, is, this can be a lot, but again, this is the price you pay, the price of entry to play in, in the Jyotish game, is learning this stuff. And in the end, I think it's a small price to pay for the wealth of uh, wisdom that you can receive in turn. So exaltation, rulership. Then if a planet is retrograde, it's also strong. I've talked about this before. When a planet's retrograde, it's closer to the Earth, and so it's brighter. And that's represented by the letter R next to a planet. It's very easy to see. Finally, uh, a final source of strength is something called Digbala. And Digbala means directional strength. Directional meaning when certain planets are on the eastern horizon, as represented by the first house. The first house is the east. That's why it's called the, uh, well, it's called the ascendant, the rising sign when planets rise on the eastern horizon. And the two planets that have special strength, directional strength, also called Dig Bala in Sanskrit. Dig Bala, not Bala, Bala. Bala means child. So in yoga, bala, asana means child's pose. This is bala, which is strength. So Jupiter and Mercury in the first house, regardless of what sign they sit in, they have strength called big bala. Um, then Mars, that should say Mars sun, not Mars Saturn. This is an error. Mars sun in the 10th house have special strength. Saturn in the seventh house has big bala. And finally, Moon and Venus in the fourth. This is an additional source of strength that is beyond exaltation, rulership, and retrogression that also gives planets strong dignity. One of the reasons for this strength is Jupiter and Mercury rule study. And in this tradition, it's best to study early in the morning when the sun is rising. That is because while we may be used to burning the midnight oil in uh, you know, studying for tests and whatnot, um, if, you wanna, if you want long-term retention, it's best to study during the sattva hours of the day. Sattva means the pure. And sunrise and just before sunrise is the most pure time to study. So Jupiter and Mercury, the planets of study, are very strong. I'm going to tell my daughter who's in college that see if she makes a difference for her. Oh, you should absolutely tell your daughter who's in college. I'm going to. Yeah. Very interesting. For, for long term. Now, if she just needs to study for a test, well, by all means, you know, <laughs> cram, 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 because grades are important. But to really hold on to the information, early morning is good. Then Mars and the sun, this should say the sun, are Digbala in the 10th. This is high noon, and the hot planets do very well uh, in the middle of the day, so Mars and the Sun. Then opposite them in the fourth house, which is midnight, this represents midnight, which is under the Earth. The Earth is the center here. There's the east, the west, the south, and the north. North is also the uh, down, the downward direction, what's directly underneath us. Um, so Moon and Venus, which are the two brightest objects in the sky after the Sun, do well when this at, at, at night when there is no sun so they get to shine the brightest so moon and venus in the fourth do very well and finally saturn in the seventh seventh is the place where the sun sets and saturn who is the sun's enemy enjoys uh, that as his source of strength because saturn is the butler sun is the king when the king goes to sleep saturn has the keys and the reins to the kingdom he gets to go wherever he wants so Saturn in the seventh house is very strong. So these are sources of strength. And just to take a look at a chart here, um, 
Well, I, don't, I, I just want to walk you through very quickly. This is the chart of Keanu Reeves. And could someone tell me, based on what we just saw, which of his planets? His planets. Saturn. Saturn, very good. And why Saturn? I was going to say Saturn too. And why? Be because the king is asleep. Yeah. And he has free reign. So Saturn has directional strength. That's one one reason. Any other reason? Retrograde. Ah, also retrograde. Very good. Yes. So the Saturn here is strong for at least two reasons. So he has double strength. This is very significant. Is, is Saturn strong for any other reason that you could tell? Yes, it's in his own sign. In uh, Capricorn. Uh, also in his own sign. I know, I know. It's in the um, 11th sign, which is Aquarius. That's right. Very good. Very good. Which is ruled by Saturn, right? Oops, where are we going here? There we go. Uh, see, Saturn rules Capricorn and Aquarius. So there it is. So now, so what do we get then? Saturn is a planet with... Hold on, let's go back to our little chart here. There we go. So Saturn is a planet with what triple strength? He's retrograde in his own sign and dig bala. This is as strong as a planet can get. So now we know that whatever this guy's profession or this person's profession is, it's gonna be at some pretty high level because of the strength of at least this planet. Now, do we have any other strong planets here? Mercury. Mercury, and why is Mercury strong? It's retrograde as well. Mercury is retrograde? It's in the first house. Sun, because it's in Leo. It sits in the first, it's sitting in the first house. So, so are you saying Mercury has one source of strength or two sources of strength? Actually, it has this aspect. It no aspects don't uh, no, no. don't factor it's in. Retrograde. Mm -hmm. Mercury is retrograde in the first house, and is sitting in. So Mercury is retrograde. Does it have another source of strength? No, Mercury doesn't. Is it the sun? No, let's stay with Mercury. Does oh. so Mercury is retrograde, yes. So that is one so source of strength. Does Mercury have another source? Yes, it's sitting in the first house. And therefore it has is it that direction strength of direction yeah i want you to use the terms i want you to start getting used to saying mercury is retrograde and has dig bala or you could say directional strength dig bala. oh that's okay. the difference gotcha. between someone who makes a hundred thousand a year and someone who makes a million a year do you think there's a difference you betcha there's a difference so learning to uh, qualify the strength of a planet is extremely important. Don't just go, oh, it's, yeah, it's strong. No. It's like saying, oh, yeah, he makes money. Question is, is it 100,000 or is it a million? So the quantity of the strength is very, very important because when we go to judge career, it's important to know, again, the level at which the person will be playing. This is one factor. Another factor that will determine the level the person is playing is what's called yogas. And yogas are combinations of planets that create specific effects. There's yogas for money, there's yogas for success, there are yogas for uh, lack of success, uh, yogas for bad health, yogas for good health. That's the final stage of Jyotish, is yogas. But we're not quite there yet. So 
but even so we have to learn the strength of the planets before we get to the yogas but so again back to Keanu we have a mercury that's not only retrograde which gives it some strength right because it's bright but it's also digbala so now we have a double strength mercury a triple strength saturn any other strong planets here i think someone said uh something about the sun isn't the sun yes, the sun is sitting in the first house as well. Oh, yes, hold on, Minta. Uh, uh, who, who, oh, okay. Who, who, what was that? The sun, the sun mm -hmm. is the ruler of the cloud, and it's sitting yes. its own sign. The sun is in its own sign. Now, so let's go back again here. The sun rules Leo. And as you can see in this chart, the sun is in Leo. Now, does the sun have any additional source of strength? In fact, he doesn't because in the, he does sit in the first house, but he doesn't have Digbala here. He has Digbala in the tenth. This should say the sun. The thing about the sun is, and he can never be retrograde is that he's strong in and of himself. He's the brightest object in the sky. When he gets any additional strength by being exalted or in his own sign or in Digbala, the sun becomes exceedingly strong, like double strong. So the sun is a special case where he doesn't even need um, special strength, but if he gets it, it's like being double strong. So in this case, there is the sun again, in its own sign of another very strong planet. So what we have here with Keanu is one triple strong planet, one double strong planet in a very strong sun. I, I'm bringing this up because this is pretty rare in horoscopes. And you'll know that whatever this person's life is about, they're playing at a high level, whatever their career is, I mean. All right. So moving on, what also makes planets strong is a full moon. And the way to tell a full moon in a chart is a full-ish moon is that it will be opposite the sun. So if you have the sun here, the moon will be in the opposite house. If you have the sun here in the 10th, the moon will be opposite because this gray dot is the earth. So when the earth is between the sun and the moon, that's called a full moon. When the sun and the moon are in the same house, it's a new moon. If we have the sun in the second house, then a full moon will be here in the eighth house. That's a very bright moon. If we have the moon in the ninth house, then a full moon means sun, moon opposite here. Now, I devote more time to this in, in the full course, um, but since we're doing career, I'm just gonna go through these, we go through all of these options. For example, sun moon together is a dark moon. This is called a new moon, where the moon is very weak. So if you see that in a chart, so let's take a look here at Keanu's again. Is the sun, uh, rather, is the moon relatively dark or relatively bright in this chart? Dark, because dark, dark, dark. dark. Very, very good, good guys. Yeah, it's relatively dark because look, it's close to the sun. It would be bright if it were somewhere in this area, right? And in fact, here is the rule of whether of how to how to know whether the moon is benefic or malefic, dark or bright. When the moon is seventy two degrees within seventy two degrees of the sun. It is considered dark. When the moon is, cons is anything above that, it's brightish, getting brighter and brighter and brighter. So 72 degrees means if the sun is at 16 Leo, 16 in Cancer is 30 degrees, 16 in Gemini is 60 degrees, 
So in fact, the moon is less than less than 60 degrees away. So it's about uh, it's, it's about 54, 55 degrees away. So it's definitely a dark moon. 72 degrees would be um, 16, 16, 30. Uh, 30, 60, 12, so it would be about two degrees and, and less. Anyway, the, my point is that when you see the moon close to the sun like this, it is definitely a dark moon and hence a weak moon for the, for the purposes of judging the strength of planet. So, Keanu happens to have a weak, weakish moon. The fact that it's with two malefics doesn't help, so he has an afflicted moon. Well, geez, everything else here is so strong. We'll see how, how this plays out. Of course, Mercury also has a source of weakness as well. Uh, Are you going to eventually tell us what this person does? Keanu Reeves is a famous actor. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Keanu Reeves has played some of the most iconic sort of savior roles, like in The Matrix. He played the Buddha. On, he played um, plays these sort of angelic savior type characters, and some silly ones as well. So here's a a, a review of Keanu's strong planets. Oops, I did that a little fast. So we got the Sun own sign, Mercury, two sources of strength, and Saturn three sources of strength. How do we pronounce this word? Big Bala. Good, Big Bala. I want you to get used to saying these terms. All right, very quickly now, I'm gonna go through what makes planets weak. So the opposite of exaltation, of course, is debilitation. So again, this is just down to memorizing. Sun debilitated in Libra. Moon debilitated in Scorpio. This is Oprah in the middle of the jungle. Jupiter in Capricorn is the Dr. Phil in the middle of the slums. Venus in Virgo, the princess in the civilized city. Mercury in Pisces, the young prince in the deserted island. Rahu Ketu, the, the snakes, the insects in the farmer's field. They get definitely not welcome there. Saturn, the butler, on the battlefield, has absolutely no strength there. He's useless there. And then Mars in Cancer, the general in the queen's chamber, he's useless there too. So planets in debilitation. Then planets are very weak when they're combust. That means within six degrees of the sun. So now taking a look again, can you see if there are any planets that are combust in this chart? Mercury is combust. Mercury, Mercury. is indeed combust. Very yeah, good. Yeah, Mercury. Yeah. yeah. And, and now, not only is it within six degrees, it's, I mean, it's within minutes of the sun. And this is something Western astrologers call Kazemi, which is when a planet is within about, what is it, 15 minutes, or 25 minutes, something like that of the sun. But the point is, this is a very combust planet, which will then cause a type of weakness and in instability to that planet. So it is possible for a planet to be both strong in some ways and weak in others. And I think, you know, we've, we've probably seen this in life. You have someone maybe who has a speech defect, but they're extremely strong or, or they can run really fast. It, you can have strength along with weakness side by side. And, and real life bears this out. Um, another source of weakness, in this case for the moon, is when the moon is dark, as we looked at. And uh, when two planets, uh, and something called planetary war, which is very rare, but it's when two planets occupy the same degree. Now here we saw that Sun and Mercury are in the same degree, but 
planetary war only happens between the real planets. And for right now, we're going to ignore it because you'll almost never see it. Uh, it's a topic for, it's a topic we'll actually cover in our Winning with Vedic Astrology course because it does play upon. Uh, my Mercury and my Venus are eight and seven. Right. So there's a planetary war between art and, and, and function. Venus is beauty and Mercury is communication. And in, in a sense, you could say Venus is right brain, Mercury is left brain. So there is a war between the two, <laughs> which can create some beautiful things. Yeah. But it can also give a, a people with a planetary war are torn in two directions. Wow, cool. Isn't the challenge to be the planetary war? Um, let me ask you guys this. Can you mute yourselves? And when you speak, to, to come in and unmute yourself. That way we're, we're not hearing one voice over another. So go ahead. Yeah. I was just asking, could you just repeat the definition of planetary war? Yes. Um, yes, and thank you for slowing me down because uh, this is a topic, again, that we want to usually that we take more time with. Um, and, and, and I'm reviewing it here, hopefully, as a review uh, in, in line with your reading as well. Uh, so the definition of planetary war as a primary source of weakness for a planet is when two planets are within one degree of longitude of each other. For example, in this chart, Sun and Mercury are within one de degree of longitude. However, planetary war only happens between the five true planets, meaning Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, Mercury, and Venus. Not Rahu Ketu and not the Sun and the Moon. So what, what happens in planetary wars, when you look at the sky at night, you will see them both occupying the same chunk of real estate. And in a sense, they're fighting for that piece of sky. There is a way to determine who wins the planetary war. Now, the two ways to determine it, number one, which planet is brighter? Number two, which planet is higher in the sky? Which planet has the higher declination? And that's something, again, I'm going to discuss in the full course because it, 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 it does have an effect on game charts, but it's too much to go into right now to know how do you know if a planet is bright by looking at the chart? Well, if it's retrograde, it's bright. But Venus is also the brightest planet in the sky. So Venus in a planetary war with anyone else will usually, if not always, win. Um, and then if it's not Venus, you have to look at which planet is the higher declination. So I don't want to go into that at the moment. But generally speaking, two planets in planetary war will both be somewhat destabilized because they're fighting for the same space. So when you have that in the person, how do you read that? It's the per in the person's life, there will be a split. They will be torn between two directions uh, in life. All right. So that's a, those are the sources of weakness. So now of planetary weakness. And again, this takes time. One, two, three, four. We have four sources of planetary weakness. We have a few more sources of planetary strength. Take your time to sort of digest, learn the exaltation, the debilitation, so that when you see them in a chart, you'll be able to judge the level of a person's potential success, money-making ability, or if the planets are very weak, their potential for health problems, career problems, and so on. Okay. Simon, can, yes. can I ask something? Um, mm -hmm. One of the difficulties or challenge that I have is with the terminology. Um, and when you speak of planetary war, and in many books, it's, you know, including Saturn, it really can be very dark. Now, my understanding of that would be to, it's a challenge to unify. Like in Western astrology, there will be an opposition, which is always a seesaw effect which can be translated through the help of something else, another medium, another planet, 
or um, aspect of some kind. And so does this planetary war and all these very sort of what I would consider fairly negative and dark, um, can they be digested? Isn't that the life purpose to digest this opposition, this, um, this tug of war, mm -hmm. in order to create something that is unif a unification in a way? Does that make sense? Emma? Yeah, absolutely that. makes sense. Um, you know, Hitler had a planetary war between Venus and Mars, and Mars won the war because he had the higher declination, I believe. Um, and he was torn between art and war, wasn't he? And well, I think he stole both. He stole all the heart. And what's the that? Piece, he combined art and war. Yeah. He stole all the heart. To steal art, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah, but and, one, yeah. The, but 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 this is what I'm getting at: is that usually there is a winner and there is a loser, and yeah. the way it plays out, and this plays out in games charts as well, is that when two planets are at war and one rules the ascendant, one team, and the other rules the seventh house, the other team, the planet that wins the planetary war is going to have a big advantage. And when it comes to sports, it shows the winner and the loser. And there's a big difference. The winner makes more money, they get glory and triumph, the loser doesn't. So in, in those black and white types of scenarios, it's hard to harmonize. There's a winner and there's a loser. So, but in personal charts, uh, certainly you have to, as a, as a professional astrologer, be able to communicate that look, you're torn between two things. And according to your chart, it looks like this may be the more, um, the easier route for you or, or the route that's the path of least resistance. So in the case of uh, the planetary war between Mercury and Venus, if Venus wins the war, then the path of beauty. If Mercury wins the war, then the path of communication or, or, or writing. So maybe you're an artist and a writer. And if Venus wins the war, maybe focus on art with less writing. If Mercury wins the war, focus on writing with art. So you're still gonna combine them, but which is gonna be the primary e example? For Hitler, it was war, plus there was something about the costumes and the way they walked, and there was some art, art there, right? Some design, and of course he stole art. But the primary thing was war. So, couldn't that, uh, uh -huh, go ahead. Couldn't that person as well um, learn to speak uh, with uh, better, like with about love, and to speak more lovingly, to to walk, you know, to watch the speech uh, in such a way that it becomes beautiful. So you, you could become a beautiful writer, for example, make beautiful film. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Twelve hours. So, yeah. but I'm trying to say. It doesn't become necessarily a war. It can become a great union, maybe. <laughs> it, it, it can, and I appreciate your, your, um, your desire to make this an evolutionary journey for, for, let's say this is a client's chart. And that's ultimately what you want to do. Uh, and you're, you're reading the chart through the filter of your own spiritual practice, and you're trying to help the client to evolve. And that's absolutely what you want to do. Um, we also have to be able to recognize that if the, the, the ancients used this terminology for a reason, that yeah. they say war because in some way the person will be torn between two things. And you have to honor that in them and say, hey, there's a war going on inside you. Because if you don't speak that language, they'll never feel that you really understand them. Very so, true. yes, your purpose is to help them evolve and harmonize. But you also have to recognize that there's a reason for the terminology. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. So as a practitioner, you are, you know, astrologies, astrologers are ruled by the fifth house in the horoscope. The fifth house is the house that straddles spirituality and reality. And that's why it's the house of the consultant. Someone who's able to draw on wisdom, but to translate it in a very earthy way. And um, that's our job as astrologers. 
we're not ninth house. Ninth house is the monk, the nun, the spiritual, you know, ascetic. We're still fifth house. We're half spiritual, half worldly. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So I appreciate what, what you're doing, and, and I agree uh, completely. I also yeah. would encourage you to honor the, the, the symbolism because it is a, a major source of weakness um, in, in a chart. All right. So, so now moving on, let's take a look at one method. Um, one method, and in fact, yeah, we'll just start with this method. There are many, again, many methods to judge career. Uh, this is one that involves the planets that are in the Kendra houses. What does that mean? It means that these houses, house one, four, seven, and 10, are the houses of uh, the four directions, and they are called the angular houses, the kendras. And in Vedic astrology, they're the most important houses. So a basic rule says that when planets occupy these houses, they will stamp that character with their influence. A, uh, the French statistician Gauquelin um, also studied the angles. He studied these four angles, and he found, as we talked about before, that when uh, Jupiter was prominent, it, it created a teaching for religious professions. When Saturn was prominent, science person was a scientist, and, and so on. So basically, all we're looking at now is to see which planets are in the Kendra houses. So let's begin. If you have the sun in a Kendra house, this gives administrative ability, the ability to organize people, to manage others. Okay, here's an example of such a chart. You see the sun? Th does this make sense, guys? Is this, this might be too easy for you after the sort of detail we just went into with planetary war and the strength of planets. This, this makes sense for me, uh, Simon. Okay, good. So I have a see, question. So the administrative is if they're in the first, fourth, seventh, or tenth house, right? Correct. Any one of those four candidates. So like my son is in my seventh house. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So that by itself. So it's very simple. Sun in the Kendra gives administrative ability. So have you worked in, in that kind of capacity? Yes. Yeah. So even if it's not your career, it still gives you that natural ability, that natural talent for those things. All right. So this is a person certainly with administrative ability. We'll get into who that is in a second. Now, if you have a cluster of planets, and in this case, Sun, Mars, and Jupiter, all of them in a Kendra, or, so all three are ideal, or at least Sun, Jupiter, or Mars, Jupiter. But ideally all three. Then we have a combination for politics and government. Now the difference is this person that, whose chart we just saw, let's take a look. Do they have this? Yes. Yeah. Sun, Mars, yeah. Moon, and Jupiter are the planets in their Kendra. So would you say this person has administrative ability? Yes. Yeah. Would you say this person would be attracted to or at least have the talent for working in the government? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this is the chart of John Kerry, former, I guess, Secretary of State. No. What was his position? Well, 
He ran for president. He's a senator. Um, lifelong career in government. And he was, uh, for Obama, he was the, oh gosh. He was a, the sort of like the... Um, he was Secretary of State. Secretary, he was, right. okay, okay, good. Uh, you know why I'm thinking he wasn't was because I was thinking Hillary was also Secretary of State. But maybe he took over after her? He, he took over after her. After okay. her. Okay, there it is. So, and a lot of people feel he should have been or could have been president. He certainly has the, the chart for it, the strength of the planets for it. Um, and in fact, in, in some of the classes that I've taken where this chart has been used, the teacher has said that this guy wakes up every day wondering why he's not president, because he has that kind of chart. Um, anyway, Sun, Mars, and Jupiter are, are prominent and, and hence give a, a predilection, a capacity for work in politics and government. Now, um, Simon, question. Mm -hmm. um, in that chart, it showed Mars retrograde. So, it wouldn't would that have an impact uh, or not in impact, determining the impact choice? Certainly, would have an impact. What kind of impact do you think it will have? Um, Based on what we just learned rendering um this particular career choice um less effective or not as strong i mean the sun is powerful and i'm thinking jupiter is uh, powerful but when mars is retrograde maybe that's not um yeah so what we're what you're doing here is applying um I guess, general Western astrology principles to Vedic astrology. And here is where we have to really get down and define our terms. So the Jupiter here is not particularly strong. Well, he's not weak either. The sun is not particularly strong because neither of them have one of the primary sources of strength we just looked at. And in fact, quite the opposite on Mars. Mars is particularly strong because he is retrograde. So I think you need Oh, okay. That's what I was asking. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So this is what we just covered as uh, primary sources of strength or weakness. So let me, I'm just going to, because really, if we don't have this, we can't really move on. So the sun, um, excuse me. So the, Retrogression is a primary source of strength because it makes planets bright. So his Mars is, in fact, strong, according to these, this principle. Now, the fact that it's retrograde also gives it a sense of... Um, retrograde planets can be bad when it comes to health because they, they indicate cells that have... A, retrograde motion like cancer cells they don't grow the way they're supposed to grow they grow in reverse or in a different way retrograde is not good um, when it comes to other areas like um, health is one of the primary uh, also when you're setting a chart for a certain event you don't want a planet retrograde because it means having to repeat things but in a planet retrograde in the seventh house could mean a second marriage but overall though that planet is also considered very strong so when it comes to judging strength don't use your intuition as your first source of information use the principles and then let your intuition fill in the information so in the case of john Kerry, let's just move to his chart here we don't have a primary source of strength for the sun. It's not Digbala. It's not in its own sign. It's not exalted. We don't have a primary source of strength for Jupiter. It's not retrograde. It's not Digbala. It's not in its own sign. It's not exalted. But we do have a primary source of strength for Mars. Now, you said Mars and Jup uh, Jupiter and sun are strong, and I would agree with you, but for different reasons, and maybe your intuition is already tapping into those reasons, but 
you know, this is still a, a, a class on basics and we, I really want you to have a, a grasp of these basics. So, um, moving on. Sorry, one more question. Sorry. Well, you know what, let, let's, let's move on here before, because I, I want to get through this and let's save them until we get through this list. Okay. <laughs> okay, tell me the question. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay, Simon. At the end. At the end. No problem. Okay. So, Sun, Mars, Saturn indicate medicine because Saturn is the planet of science. Okay. Sun or Mars here are primary, meaning that Sun, Saturn, or Mars, Saturn could also do it, but all three much more readily points us towards a career in medicine if all three are angular. Okay, then just Sun and Jupiter gives a career in healing religion or spiritual subjects. It gives a natural spirituality to the person. Now look at the difference here. If Sun, Mars, Jupiter is politics, but just Sun, Jupiter is um, the relig uh, religion, teaching, health, healing field. So when we look at uh, combinations, you want to default to the most complex combo. That means that the combination that is with the most planets is the one that the person is likely to default to. So if John Kerry only had Sun, Jupiter in the angles, he may have been more inclined to go into teaching, religion, spirituality, or healing. But because he had Sun, Jupiter, and Mars, he defaults to politics. So again, so here. all of these they have to be. So all of these they have to be together to have these um, um, aspects. They have to be anywhere in these four angular houses. So you can see here they're not together. Angular. They're okay, anywhere. Okay. In any of the four houses. I think I missed that part. Okay. Right. I didn't think I missed the angular part. Okay. Okay. All right. So then Moon Jupiter, networking, communication, travel. Travel, especially if the movable signs are indicated. So Moon Jupiter is a great, Moon Jupiter in the angles is great for public career, um, advertising, uh, being out in the public travel, seeing the world, networking. Does this person have that combination? Yes, yes no? he has Moon and Jupiter. Yeah, he has Moon and Jupiter angular as well. Now, why isn't travel his main career? Well, again, default, we're defaulting to the most complex combination. So Moon Jupiter may be a part of his career. And does he travel? Boy, you bet he does travel, doesn't he? Does he network and communicate with others? Well, that's part of his role as Secretary of State, as a Senator, and so on. Does he work with the public? You bet. Those are all Moon Jupiter combos. But again, for the career, you want to default to the most complex. Likewise, if a person has just Sun, Mars together, that could mean other things, or let's say Mars, Saturn, but Sun, Mars, Saturn would tend to incline to medicine. Just Mars, Saturn could be military career, or it could be real estate. So default to the most complex combination. All right, Moon, Mercury, writing. Moon, Mercury, and angles. Writing. Let's see, does this guy have this? Does John Kerry have the writing combination? No. No. Why? Because Mercury is not in an angle. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. Then we have Moon and Venus. Food and beverage, art, beauty, music, entertainment. Even one by itself will do it if it is strong. 
Well, let's see Mr. Carey again. Does he have Moon and Venus? No, Venus is no. not in an angle. But does he have one of them? Yes. And is it strong? Yes. yes. Why is it strong? It's exalted. Hmm. It's, it's the house of Taurus, ruled by Taurus. It's, Venus. it's in Taurus, right? The sign of Taurus, which is its exaltation point. Very good. So moon is exalted. So by itself, this will give uh, food and beverage, restaurant, arts, and, or possibly arts and entertainment. But again, because we default to the most complex combination, this isn't primary. But has this played out in his life? You bet your butt it's played out in his life. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, because what house does that moon sit in? In his seventh house, and he's married to the... Uh the daughter of the Heinz family. Bingo, yeah. Beverage. So that's food and beverage comes to him through his partner, through his spouse. Very good, good. Now, of course, we know that. Uh, and then we're going to see in a second the Mars-Moon combo, which is going to really confirm that for us. So even Moon or Venus by themselves can do it if they're strong. All right. Then Moon, Venus, and Saturn gives entertainment business. Saturn is business. So Saturn, Moon can do it. That was Elvis. Saturn, Venus, or Saturn, Moon, Venus, which Cher has. And she has been a diva in the entertainment business since the early 70s. Um, so Saturn, Moon, Venus, entertainment business. Then Saturn, Moon, Mars is sports business, which can mean anything from being an athlete to actually being involved as a commentator or somehow being involved in the sports entertainment business. Because the moon is the public, Mars is sports, and Saturn is business. Um, Saturn doesn't equal brute strength. Mars equals brute strength. Saturn equals the business part of it. So this slide here is wrong. Then here is the combo that Mr. Carey has, Moon-Mars. Moon-Mars shows you, Moon-Mars is called, is a special yoga in Vedic astrology. I just uh, mentioned yogas. Um, it's called Chandra Mangala Yoga, Moon Mars combination, which means money will come to you through women, especially, and specifically through the house that they occupy. So if you have Chandra Mangala Yoga in the fourth house, you could very well make money from your mother, from your mother's property, or from property in general, because the fourth house is land and houses. If you have Moon, Mars in the seventh, you make money from your partner, which is the case with John Kerry, who has Moon, Mars in his seventh house. And he, by marrying into that fortune, he made a lot of money. Make sense? Here is that, here is that chart again. And again, how much money did he make by marrying was it in the tens of dollars, in the hundreds of dollars, in the thousands, in the tens of thousands, in the millions? How can you tell? Retrograde. Yeah, you tell by are the planets strong? That's one of, one of the main ways. So we have a retrograde Mars, which is strong. And what about the moon? Moon sitting in the, uh, the house that's ruled by Taurus. It's not ruled by Taurus. It, the ruler is a planet. It it's Venus. Is Taurus. Sorry. Venus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So moon sits in Taurus, which is its exaltation sign. So moon is exalted. You can simply say moon is exalted. So remember the signs don't rule anything. The signs are just pieces of real estate, like your house. Your house is ruled by, owned by you or your landlord. But the, the signs themselves are just real estate. So the moon sits in Taurus where it is exalted. Okay. So yeah, very good. So moon is very strong, Mars is very strong. So this person has made lots of money through partnership. What if the moon were debilitated and Mars were combust? Well, if the moon were debilitated, Mars would be in its own sign. But yeah, if Mars were combust, then there would be problems with that income. So what I'm trying to convey is that if a planet is also weak, there will also be problems. Um, and that's why it's important to know when a planet's weak and when it's strong. Okay. All right. Moving on. Oops. Sorry about that. All right. Moving on. Mars, Saturn, Mercury. Now, this is a combo that creates a number of things. Uh, one of them is like Mars, Saturn, Moon, sports business. Because again, we have Mars, energy, and Saturn, control and discipline. Mercury uh, rules business. But we also have electrical engineering, working with machines. Mercury is the left brain, very logical kind of uh, thinking. Mars is metal, men, and machines, and Saturn is discipline and structure. So this is an engineering combination as well. All right, so Mars, Mercury, also computers. When you have Rahu involved, always think of internet. Rahu is the World Wide Web. Um, so Rahu Mercury together indicates graphic design. It can indicate photography. Um, it's innovative technology. So photography was the innovative technology for the last century, at least the beginning and most of the last century. Um, in the 21st century, it's more internet. So Rahu Mercury indicates innovative technology. Add Mars to it and you get computers. Okay. Mars, Jupiter, law, politics, debate. Jupiter being the primary. So let me just go back to um, Carrie's chart. Do you see that in his chart? And Tom, um, you seem to be the authority here on John and Kerry. Um, does he, was he a lawyer as well? Does he have a law degree to your knowledge? I don't know about that one. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> All right, well, let's do a quick Google search here then. Um, I just Googled John Kerry, lawyer. Um, after receiving a JD from Boston College Law School, Kerry worked as an assistant district attorney in Massachusetts. So there you go. So also a lawyer. Um, all right, so let's go back to our presentation. Can you guys see my screen here? Yes. Oh, okay, so you can see the Wikipedia entry here. Okay. There we go. Yeah, so he's also a lawyer, so a very accomplished person. Um, probably has some medical knowledge as well, or at least interest with the Sun and Mars also being prominent. Um, so a very dynamic chart. But again, the combo that is the most complex gets the uh, the prime billing, which is the 
politics combination. All right, so let's just go through this. All right, so there's Mars Jupiter. Mars Venus is primal charisma. It is um, acting, modeling, physicality, sexuality, Mars Venus. If they're weak, there can be a scandal and problems because of that sexuality and physicality. But Mars Venus in, in an angle gives that, yes. Um, so going back up to the Mars Jupiter, it's if they're in the angular house or just in any house together? Yeah, so this is a good question. So if they're in an angular house, it makes that stand out. But the thing about these combinations is anywhere you have them in your chart, they will tend to give that talent. So you can actually have Mars, Mars Jupiter not in an angle and still it will give you that ability to draw to law and, and, and politics. So I've, I've seen Mars Jupiter in the fifth house, in the 11th house, and they always make the person either work somehow in with law, politics, debate, or at least have a talent for it. Do you find that in your chart, Minta? I'm finding it in my daughter's chart, as, but it's in the 12th house. So it means foreign or um, uh, charity. charity uh, so working in um, fields that, because the 12th house is the house of, uh, what do you call it? The house of um, uh, not-for-profits, uh, things that are done. Okay. Does that make sense? I don't know, she's only 23, so I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, well, so Mars, Jupiter, and the 12th, 12th is one of the harder places to interpret because it's 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 six the sixth eight and the twelfth houses are the difficult houses of the horoscope because they don't allow things in them to really shine okay. on the world. But it'll okay. still give uh, an interest in human rights in uh, in in um, uh, you know not for profit uh, that that kind of that kind of stuff. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th this is actually a germane question because what if they're not in Kendras? Well, if they're not in Kendras, um, then they'll still play out, but maybe not in the forefront of the person's life. All right, so here's a question about Jupiter, Venus, Mars. So wait till we get through all the combos and then you can ask that question. All right, Mars, Saturn. <clears throat> Mars, Saturn, these are the two planets of hard work, force, structure, force for Mars, structure for Saturn. So building, labor, real estate, construction, military, police. And if the fourth house is involved, definitely real estate. Strong houses for real estate. Also engineering, see Mars, Saturn here. To know whether it's engineering or just heavy labor, you have to see if the planet Mercury, if the planets of education are strong because to become an engineer, you need a good education. Otherwise, you're a brute laborer, right? So Mars and Saturn will give the work, the labor. Mercury will give um, the education. So Mars and Saturn, very common combination. Add Rahu to it and you get science. Especially Rahu meaning innovative science, like research, you know, using, splitting the genome, um, that kind of stuff. Mars, Saturn, Rahu is science. Then Mercury, Jupiter. <clears throat> financial industry, finance, also writing and communication because these are the two planets of study, education, communication, writing, and finance. Also acting for its own sake. Oops. Oh, I don't know what we just did here. Okay. 
acting for its own sake, uh, as opposed to uh, Hollywood acting. Okay. Next we have Mercury, Jupiter, Venus. And for here, you have Jupiter is the educator planet. <clears throat> Venus is also, in Vedic astrology, a strong educator planet. You, you don't, we don't think about this in Western astrology. But Venus is the guru of the, of the demons because he teaches them the art <clears throat> of uh, resuscitation, of bringing themselves back to life. Jupiter is the guru of the gods. So when Jupiter and or Venus are prominent, always think education. Education, education. Sometimes it can be acting, but it's usually education. So these are the three planets with Jupiter or Venus primary. So Minta, you asked about Venus, Mercury, planetary war. That's also a combination for a teacher. Oh, okay, great. And a teacher is someone, think about it, who gives up part of their own life, their, their private life, to be of service to, to the class, to the student. Let's say you have a teacher who is 35 years old and they're teaching third graders. Well, she has to give up or he has to give up part of their adult personality. So that planetary war is something has to lose in a sense, so another part comes through. But that loss can be by choice. So teachers often do that anyway. They give up part of their need for adult company to be with children. Um, of course, you can be a teacher of adults as well. But um, so Mercury, Venus can be education. Jupiter, Venus, education. Jupiter, Mercury, also education. Okay. Jupiter, Venus specifically can also be consultant, the guru, being a guru to others. And then Mercury Saturn is a combo for business. Mercury communication, Saturn structure, uh, it's, a very, it's, it's a good combo for business. And finally, Jupiter Saturn Rahu, which rules the occult particularly with Rahu being primary. Now, there was a question about Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. So now that we've gone through all of them, with Mars, Venus, Jupiter, you have to be very careful to see which are the planets that are gonna play out, which are the strongest. Because you can see Jupiter, Venus is education, educator. But Mars, Venus is primal charisma. So certainly acting could be come to the forefront, especially if Mars and Venus are strong. Education and consulting, counseling can come to the forefront if Jupiter is, is, and Venus are strong. Uh, if it's Mars and Jupiter, then the interest is in law, politics, debate. So again, here you're going to want to parse which are the strongest or most juicy planet so when you look at the chart you go wow that mars is just incredible and that will hot key the person's life so it's going to be more acting or politics rather than um counseling did you say something about um, um mercury and venus being an educator is that correct correct Yes. Is that, but that's without Jupiter, or does it have to have Jupiter with them? Well, as you can see here on the screen, Jupiter or Venus are the primary, so, which means one of them plus Mercury is enough. So Venus, Mercury, or Jupiter, Mercury is enough to key education. Okay, because like check. I said, I have my Mercury and my Venus in the same house, so... Mm -hmm. And now, is it in the Kendra house? It's in the sixth. In the sixth, okay. So it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be in a Kendra house, which is going to key the career, but it's still going to be an impulse. 
meaning okay. uh, so have you have you been involved in education yes yeah and the sixth house is the house of service as well yes uh, done that too <laughs> yeah so you have a very rich chart with a lot to draw on so the, the point here is that these combos will work outside of the kendras as well but they're most visible when they're in a kendra in any of the kendras okay and um no we didn't use k2 uh k2 as a planet indicates um K2 will act like Mars, so it indicates engineering and computers um, because K2, again, like Rahu, rules innovation uh, and like Mars. See, Rahu, there's a saying that, say, that says, uh, Shanivat Rahu, um, Kujavat uh, K2. Rahu will act like Saturn, K2 acts like Mars. So K2, when acting like Mars, will give a pension for engineering and computers. Also, mysticism and, and, and so on, if other planets of mysticism like Jupiter and the sun are involved. Remember, Jupiter's sun was the spiritual combination. So that's a good question on K2. If it's just K2 or K2 and Saturn, think computers, science, engineering. If it's K2 with Jupiter and Sun or Venus, then think education and mysticism. Okay? All right, so let's see. Yeah, so now we start getting specific questions and everybody wants to know about their chart. So. So Rahu and Saturn are the occult combination, right? And uh, occult simply means that which is not visible, that which is unseen. And uh, certainly what sheds light on the unseen is Vedic astrology. It's called Jyoti. Jyoti means light, Jyotisha. So the science of light, um, which is why people who write books on Jyotisha call them light on life or path of light because it's about shedding light on what's typically hidden in a cult. All right. I want to show you um, another technique. And let's see. So that's uh, career technique number one, which is a unique way of looking at career through analyzing how planets come together to influence our personalities. So the reason I bring this to you now in the sort of beginning class is because um, not necessarily for you to start predicting people's careers, but so you can see how planets work together and get a gist for their personalities. Start sort of getting to know the planets and one way to get to know them is through these combos so if someone is ruled by mars and venus and those are like the two planets they come out you're going to think they're going to be kind of sensual charismatic people uh kardashian uh has this mars and venus in her 10th house of career so and they're both strong mars i think is in its own sign so we have a primarily sexually sort of person who makes their money through primal charisma. Uh, in, in other people, actors and models and so on who have Mars and Venus, that's what comes across. You have Saturn and Rahu, it's a whole nother thing, right? It's a different energy, it's a different vibe. Now you have science, you have research, you have the occult coming into play. So. Um, this is a useful way to begin talking with the planets to see uh, and to see how they're um, uh, what, what kind of dharma they are recommending for the personality. All right. Now, another way 
let's see if I can sneak a second method to you. This is buy one, get one free. This is extra bonus. The second technique I'm going to show you involves a Western method that works really well when it applies. And that method is simply this. When a planet sits within, uh, let me read it, the closest planet to the 10th house cusp will often key the career. Okay, I'll say that again. The closest planet to the 10th house cusp will key the career. We've learned the houses, so here are the houses. One, two, three, four, five. Every house has a specific degree that is the cusp, that is the peak of that house. A cusp is like an invisible property line. If you're looking at the sky, you can't see cusps. You may see signs and constellations. But just like when you look at the earth, there is an invisible property line that demarcates your house from your neighbor's house. And these property lines are important. Like just try, try throwing a party in your neighbor's backyard and see what happens. They'll call the cops on you. Even though it's not visible, that property line makes a difference. And where that line is, is called the cusp in, Vedic astro in, in astrology. And the 10th cusp, which is the cusp of the 10th house of career, is a very sensitive point. If the midheaven. It's the midheaven, that's right. It's called the MC or the midheaven. So if you have a planet that's close to that 10th cusp, it will often tend to key your career expression. So in this case, let's take a look. And by the way, you won't believe this, but I just pulled up this chart, Angelina, randomly. And I look to see if she has this, and she does. So she's the second chart I pulled. So to find the cusp in Vedic astrology, we look at these tables. So this software here gives us a table. And this is how you pull it up. You click on it. You would go down in this column here under tables to KP significators. Click OK. and it. Krishnamurti chart is selected here. Krishnamurti chart means we're using the Placidus house system, which is the standard house system in Western astrology. So the 10th cusp is at 24 degrees Pisces. What is the nearest planet to that 10th cusp? Saturn? Saturn is not the nearest planet. It's in Gemini. It's in fact square the 10th cusp, but it's. Okay, that, okay then Mercury, yes. Would it be no, Jupiter? No, Mercury sextile that cusp, but it's not near it. Would it be Jupiter? Yeah, there's Jupiter right there in Pisces. So when I say near it, I mean physically near it, not close to it in degrees, but four signs away. I was looking at the wrong one. <laughs> Okay, so Pisces is the number 12, right? So, no, so what you're doing is also correct. So Saturn here would square that cusp, but we don't care about squares. We want the planet that's closest in space to it. And that happens to be Jupiter. So Jupiter is the planet of education. It's a planet of counseling, consulting, but it's also one of the planets in the actor's combination. So those are possible careers. And I would put it to you that Angelina Jolie, after she ceases to be an actress, in my opinion, she may very well begin to take on a consulting, counseling, educational role um, in society sort of a good well she's already a goodwill ambassador for the un she goes around giving speeches and presumably i think she may want to do that more um, as she gets older 
All right, so the 10th house is what you do. That's your career house. And so the 10th house will often key your profession. But what we do often is an expression of who we are. And who we are is the first house, the first cusp, which is right here. So we can also apply this technique with the first house cusp, which is the ascendant. So obviously in her chart, which is the planet closest to her first house cusp? Venus. Venus. Yeah, Venus. I mean, there's nothing else even close, right? So who she is then is Venus. What she does is Jupiter. So you can actually, if both apply, if there are planets close to both cusps, and by close, I mean, you know, use your own good judgment, but within 10 degrees, I would say. Then again, we have Venus and Jupiter. And Venus and Jupiter um, were two of the planets that indicate there is Venus Jupiter. Counseling, acting, or advising. Oops. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. So those two are her primary planets. Does anyone here have uh, planets that are close to their 10th house or first house cusp? I have actually two that are kind of close to my 10th, my Jupiter, Jupiter and Saturn, but I think my Saturn is closer. And for my first house, it would be my moon. Okay. So, um, so then you have Jupiter. So how many degrees is your 10th house cusp and which sign is it in? It's in Aries mm -hmm. and um, it's five degrees. Okay. And so where is, and how many degrees is Jupiter in Aries? Um, Jupiter is actually in Taurus uh -huh. and, it's six, and it's 16. Okay, so that's about 45 degrees away. So that's out of range, I would say. Okay. And my Saturn is over in Pisces at three. That's about 30 degrees away. So, yeah, so those are the two closest. Um, you're right. Mm -hmm. And yet they're not quite, so they could still key your career. So education would be part of your career. Um, and then you said moon also? My moon is um, in my second house at 17. I have nothing in my first house. Got it. Got it. Okay. So with Jupiter and Saturn being the closest planets, um, Jupiter, uh, Jupiter and Saturn are what I call the Barack Obama combination. They have a strong, because he has those in his ascendant. And it's a strong interest in philosophy and righteousness, sometimes law. Um, but certainly makes the person a philosopher. And whether that's your profession, often, not right now. Not right now. But often, because of that interest, people will turn to education and become educators. Interesting. Okay. All right. Anyone else have prominent, uh, have a planets close to the 10th cusp or the first cusp? that you'd like to share. Okay, so. Um, I have uh, um, my moon um, close to the cusp of my 10th house. It's 27, point, um, 27 degrees. Is that close? It's within 27 degrees. Again, it's not super close. I would want them to be about 10 degrees, no more than 10 for it to really have that discernible effect that you can predict with. But still, yeah, so the moon rules the public working in, um, working in a public profession, sometimes hotel, restaurant. Uh, what sign is it in? It's in Aquarius. Okay. And um, 
in what profession you you do or have you done? I teach. You teach, so you're an educator, okay? Um, and do you have any of the other educator combinations? I have. Um, I think it was was Jupiter one of the educators? Correct. Yeah, I have Jupiter. I also have a planet in the 10th house. You're talking about planets that are close to the cusp, but what about planets that are actually in the 10th house? Would they have a, a clearer or Absolutely. more significant impact? Absolutely, yes. Okay. I have Rahu in the 10th house. Okay. So Rahu would indicate foreignness or innovation. So teaching, uh, so even if as an educator, you would be educating to a special a group or uh, teaching um, innovative scientific or foreign subjects. I do both and I've taught abroad as well for many and years. And you've taught abroad as well. Okay. And what specifically do you teach? Now I teach massage therapy, uh -huh. but I used to teach uh, English as a second language. Um, right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, massage would also indicate, um, and, and I would say there would be an innovative flair to, to your education style, to how you teach and what you teach. There would be a, a innovation and, and um, progressiveness, not just yeah. the same old, same old. Definitely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So again, everything plays out. So good point. So when there are planets in the 10th house, they will, you, we can consider this method number three, they will also key your career expression. And so for her example, Rahu being there, they added a sense of working with foreigners or with special groups, English as a second language, or doing uh, possibly technology in, in other innovative uh, fields. Very good, guys. I mean, obviously you guys know your stuff and, and your 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 this um, and hopefully you're beginning to see the Jyotisha can can really help to shed light on um, the multiple facets of, of people's lives, including as we'll be talking about in the course, um, how to judge the winner in a contest chart. But we're also going to be studying how to um, judge between what's the best option. You know, I, I could go to work in San Diego, in New York, or in Buenos Aires, which is the best place for me? When, and when San Diego it comes, has a lot of traffic. I don't count. I wouldn't vote for that. What's that? San Diego has a lot of traffic. I don't vote for that. There you go. So, uh, yes, yes, but if you're, ju you're judging the chart of a client, you can't let your opinion interfere, right? Because if you're working with the chart of your daughter or of your uh, a friend or a, or, a, or a client who's paying you, you get out of the way, right? And you just become an interpreter for their chart. I know, so, I was just kidding you. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what I've heard, that San Diego is not what it used to be 20 years ago, that the traffic is just horrible now. No, it's not even, it's really bad. Yeah, so... Anyway, so we don't pick San Diego, but there's still Buenos Aires or Chicago. So we have to know how to choose that when looking at a horoscope. Uh, so there are many applications for this information, and, um, but it all comes back to the basics, which is, is this planet strong? Is this planet weak? Is, I hope you can understand what I mean, because if planet A is very weak and it represents San Diego, and planet B is very strong and it represents Chicago, well, that's going to help us make our choice, right? So, um, all right, so now... Um, Simon, this, could I ask a question, please? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, uh, some, some clarification about the cusp, and I'm looking at Angelina Jolie's chart. Uh, mm -hmm. So according to the Krishnamurti, uh, details down here that the 10th the house cusp is in 24 degrees Pisces. Correct. But Pisces is the ninth house, correct? Correct. 
Yeah. So, so what happens? The tenth house what, is not necessarily in the same house. That's what happens uh, during the summer when the days are very long. Um, huh. In fact, let's see if I can represent this to you in a Western astrology chart, and it may make more sense. When the days are very long, the houses will stretch out, and the cusps will stretch out. So let me input her information here. Angelina, and I'll just show you in um, in the Western astrology chart. Uh, June 4th, 1975, 9.09 a.m. All right. All right. June 4th, 1979, 909. So here's the Placidus house system. This is a Western astrology program called Solar Fire, which is one of the top Western programs. Um, Simon, her year, year was 1975 on the chart? Was it 75? Looked it like was 75. 75. You're right. June 4th, 1975 at 909. All right. So let's go back and edit that. June 4th, 1975. Thank you. All right. All right. So there we go. So now, Tom, this is the 10th house cusp. And as you can see, um, it's not exactly directly overhead. It's tilted. See how it's tilted? Okay. That is one way to reflect the, the fact that it's a very long day. So during the summer, the 10th house cusp, as the days get longer, will drift this way to the right during because the winter, it's summer solstice that's what i figured out during the winter when the days are short the 10th house cusp will be to the left because the 10th house cusp represents um essentially represents noon time midday and the exact time of midday when during winter is not 12 it's usually 11 11 something or sometimes even 10 something it, o'clock during the summer midday is is past 12 sometimes it's 1 p.m when the sun sets very late the 10th house cusp is in an approximation of the exact midday so it, because it's the summer it's later Anyway, I was hoping this could help. This actually helps also in helping us see which planet is closest to the 10th cusp. You can see there's Jupiter. And okay. there's the first cusp, Venus. So Western astrology chart, this circle chart, is easier to read in some respects than the Vedic. But the Vedic chart definitely has its advantages when it comes to other things. Um, among them, looking at the Kendras. So, all right, let's see, we have a question here. Okay, right, we covered that. So, uh, Tom, uh, I hope that makes sense. Did that make sense or, or is it more... Uh it, it, it does help somewhat, thank you. Help somewhat, okay. So it is possible, and you will see charts where um, the 10th cusp is actually in the 9th or sometimes in the 11th house. Ah. And when it comes to game charts, that's a special configuration that I call stolen cusps, which um, means that a planet close to that cusp will have less of an effect. And in some way, we could see this in Angelina's chart, can't we? Where Jupiter is conjunct her 10th cusp, but it's not in the 10th house. So she's less of a teacher and a mentor than she is a beauty queen, right? Because Venus conjunct her first house is very much 
in an angle. And in fact, it's the only angular planet, which our career method shows us means the person will be oriented towards the arts, fashion, entertainment. So combining these methods often will help us arrive at, at a holistic sort of um, prediction. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, brief career method. Um, this is taught by my teacher, Hard Defoe, and I haven't really seen it taught anywhere else. Um, so I could have shown you a bunch of other stuff that you'll find in the books, but I thought you might enjoy this since it is a sort of a unique perspective on helping people find their career. Um, this was good. Thank you, Simon. You're very welcome. Yes, Sylvie, ask your question. I know you've been holding on. Thank you. Yes, are you still there? Yes, thank you very much, sorry. Um, it's in relationship to the Kendras and to the strength. So if, for example, someone has a medium strength um, son uh, in the first house, has a Mars in the 10th that is retrograde and, and obviously strong, for example. But because Mars is in the West and the Sun is in the East, even though the Sun looks weaker, does that mean who is the strongest then? Well, Mars in the 10th house is not in the West, it's in the South. No, 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 sorry, sorry in the 10th, so sorry, in the 7th house. I'm just looking, I was staring at a chart in front of me. Uh -huh. You know, so Mars is in the seventh house in the west direction. Mm -hmm. The Sun or Jupiter um, for, is in the first house, but not necessarily as strong as Mars per se, but obviously in the east. Mm -hmm. So which out of the two would you say is we stronger? We, we prefer the east. So I think I understand your question. If it's Jupiter in the first house, then it has primary strength because Jupiter is big bala there. But I think what you mean if it's the sun is in the first, which has neither Digbala or anything else, and Mars is in the seventh, which has neither Digbala or any other source of strength, which would you prefer in terms of influence? Well, the sun will most likely influence you because it's the ascendant slightly more, and Mars will influence your partnerships because it's in the seventh house. So with John Kerry, we saw he has Mars retrograde in the seventh, in a wealth combination there, which played out in his, uh, in the area of his relationship. So in the combination of Jupiter in the first and Mars in the seventh, um, Jupiter would, would tend to win out? Yes, well, yeah, unless Mars is in its own sign or exalted or retrograde, because Jupiter has big bala. Lovely, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And that combo then with Jupiter Mars opposite will is is the politics law debate combination. So we're looking at legal profession, education, possibly even politics. Yeah, that's that's mine. And um, I've always been interested in law, and I have a degree in industrial relation, but I've never. Anyway, thank you very much. Yes, and that's a, that's uh, so again with Jupiter being the, the stronger planet, it's going to give more of an interest in the philosophy of law and the, the, the purpose of law versus the actual arguing, which is Mars, right? Which is defeating the other side, which is conquering, fighting for your client. But, yeah, and it's exactly, it's up spot on. Yeah, I don't like right. that at all. Right? Whereas if a person had Jupiter, Mars, and Kendras, but Mars was the dominant planet, then it would be trial lawyer, right? The person who is there because, so they could defeat, they get something, their dharma is to be more adversarial. Yeah. In your case, it's more for the spirit of the law. Yes, the research and the, all yeah. things. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And thank you thank for you. being patient. And the, <laughs> I, the, the, those are, it's a great question. <laughs> And I apologize for cutting you off earlier. No problem. Bless you. Bye. <laughs> All right. So any other questions before we call it a day today? I have a question. Yes. About, um, you said that you're going to be offering a um, class 
for over about all of this? Yes. A course um, training. Yeah. So um, what I do mainly full time is what's called the Dharma Type Certification Course, which okay. is a year long program. Now, you guys who have already enrolled into the Winning with Jyotisha program, the price of Winning with Jyotisha, which is nine ninety five, you can apply full price towards the Dharma Type Certification, which is a more high end program. But yes, that is the program um, where we go into much more detail about every aspect of Dharma. And okay, so when, so when is the next round of when you start this? The next round, uh, we're just completing DTC 2016. Um, it, it ends this month in March. And then the next round will be, uh, I haven't set a date. That's why I'm hemming and hawing here. Okay. But it will be it'll be a few weeks after after that, so probably sometime in April. Okay, well, so are you gonna send out notices to yes. let us know when it is and stuff like that? Okay, great, perfect. Yes, I will. And if you guys who are interested in, in it now, who are part of this course, like I said, you get the full price of this course towards that. And also I can get you in at the 2016 rate since the course is still going on, because the 2017 it'll go up a little bit. Um, so I will send out a notice to you. Yes, to everyone. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Simon, I have a question. Yes. Um, so we're finishing up the free segment mm -hmm. uh, for the Winning with Jochus. So when is the Jochus class going to start? Yes. Oh, good question. And I should have announced this at the beginning. So we start March 12th. It's on a Sunday and we will continue every Sunday. Um, and I've made it on a Sunday to accommodate most people's schedules because I understand that you're taking time out of work and your daily life to be here. Um, so my goal is to make it fit uh, as, as much as possible. Uh, it'll be Sunday at, I believe, 10 a.m. Um, and um, it, it will continue for uh, all nine, I have a feeling it's gonna be more than nine weeks, but. Uh, the full length of the course will continue nine to 12 weeks on Sunday. And that course is what we've been doing? Well, that course is specifically winning with Vedic astrology, and I'm going to oh, go okay. into mm -hmm. sports and predicting the outcome of sporting events. And you said 10 a.m., meaning 10 a.m., what time zone? 10 a.m. Uh, mountain time zone. So it's going to be 9 Pacific, 12 um, Eastern. on Sundays. March 12th is the beginning and we'll do once a week, every week. Okay. Um, okay, uh, I, I will have to send you an email. Um, unfortunately, I'm committed on Sundays. <laughs> oh, you're committed on so Sundays. I, okay. Yeah, so, but no, I'm, I'm going to have to work this now. I, I thought we were set for Tuesdays, which would have been perfect. But uh, I'll send you an email, Simon. All right. Well, um, look, I, I want to work with, with you guys who are the students. It's not about when it's convenient for me. It's when it's convenient for you. So. To that end, um, I'd still like to start March 12th. I think it's a good day to start, but we can adjust the uh, the sessions um, maybe to a later, to a different day after we begin. I'm open to that. I'm absolutely open to it. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna keep March 12th, but um, do send me an email and, and, and let me know which days work better for you if Sunday doesn't work for you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Well, thank you for um, bearing with me here on this Thursday and um, we'll see you guys soon. I will keep in touch by email. Uh, if you guys have subscribed to my newsletters, um, you should have, uh, you, you will get the updates. Okay. All righty. Um, thanks again, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.